I didn't have any toilet paper in my room. They gave me this. This is going to be a good one. More of what do you want? Hold your, hold your bag. Where you want your okay. Without further ado, welcome to welcome to our coffee with. As you know, last year we had we had a conversation with Maggie Gyllenhaal and Peter Sarsgaard, and this year we we are really fortunate to have Michael Murphy and Emmett Walsh. Uh, here to entertain you so early in the morning. I'm going to turn things over to Jay Craven. And um, for those who want to go see Nashville, we'll be screening that about 9.30 over at Town Hall Theater. We'll probably be wrapping this up just before 9.30. Okay, thanks very much. I see Nashville, yeah. Are we sharing the mic? Sharing the mic, yeah. Uh. <laughs> or, or, or you can each have one and Jake can just talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's hard to get a mic away from this guy. <laughs> had you guys know each other before? Yeah. Yeah. Had you had we worked together? What's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? Together. Okay. He stole the show. He stole the show. Yeah, he doesn't remember. But no, I, 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 I. What I remember was uh, <clears throat> Streisand. Streisand was big then. Oh. Hey, look at you're going to hear me without the mic. Like, open your bloody ears and you'll hear me. Here's your mic, you turkey crock. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, okay. The uh, I'll, be going Jake to I'll make sure you hear it. Who can't hear me? Yeah, go get that guy. The uh, the uh, what now was I talking about? Forget it. Let's go to the next question. Barbara Streisand. Streisand. What do you remember about what's up, Doc? Yeah, uh, the uh, there was... No, okay, I, I don't it. want to tell the story. Okay. <laughs> it's a different. It's a. It's, it's not. It's not right. Go ahead. Something else. I was one of the suitcases, and he arrested us. Everybody got their suitcases mixed up. It was sort of a dumb movie until he got there. That ain't the way I remember. It. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Maybe we should all uh, tell a story. Okay. Why don't we do that? Michael, you got a story, a movie story. Good night, Moon. Anything you like. <laughs> Wake people up in the morning. Tell a movie story. You want? To, you should start this. Oh, oh, you're talking to me. You got the yeah. story. Yeah. I, I, I thought you were Mike. Uh, uh, a movie story. Yeah, a story about about a movie you were on, or a movie person you know, or a story you heard from a movie person. I'll tell one too if we get to it. The. Uh, um, that, that, too quick. I can't. I can't. can't do I, it? I gotta. No. All right. Are any of you gonna get to it? Are you gonna see? Are you gonna see Nashville today? Okay, I'll tell you. Because Alan, Alan's here. Alan Nichols. Uh, he and I were, and uh, this gal named Tina Rains were, and we were in a scene together. And Tina was Keith Carradine's girlfriend, and she was very attractive, and she had that flat affect of the '60s, you know. Where, all the guys in the movie were going, oh, hi, Tina, and she'd go, and she, she'd never, she'd never been in a movie before, and she was uh, kind of nervous, and so, um, Alan and, and uh, Tina are playing a scene, and I barge in on them, and I'm trying to get them to, I'm playing this uh, political guy, and I'm trying to get him to perform for us at a show, and Bob Altman and I were standing in the doorway, and um, I'm watching them, we did. A, we had done a rehearsal, and I see them, and they're having this big fight. And then I barge in on the fight, and I, I s leaned over to Bob. And I said, "I should play this like I have the hots for it, you know, because she's real beautiful, and I'm playing this really uptight guy." And he had his hand on my shoulder, and he just pushed me in, and he said, "Just go do it." And that's how he directed. <laughs> I mean, he didn't want to know what you were up to, or you know, he, he didn't give me the show. Uh -huh. Another movie we're showing today. Uh, um, is uh, Mrs. McCabe Miller. and Mrs. Miller, and uh, he gets me a call. He said, uh, Murphy, this is Bobby. He said, you want to be in this Western? I'm, I said, yeah. And he said, okay, I'll pay you 600 a week, and I need my car up here. He was in Vancouver, and so I drove his car to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, I was playing a, a guy who was in the... Um, he, I represented the, you know, the industry. The industry was moving in on this little town that Warren Beatty had got going and we want to buy him out and um, I said what do you want me to do with this Bob what are you, what are you thinking about this part and he says ah oh, you know he's somebody's nephew and that's all I needed to know you know it was perfect it was just yeah he's somebody's nephew you know and, and they'd sent this dweeb on a mission you know and I, 
really, and he was, he was very much that way. He'd give it to you like that. So those are two Bob Altman stories for you. Now it's your turn. But I put you to sleep. <laughs> what is it about about doing this, about showing up, about being on set, about moving into a community that is, in some cases, familiar people, in other cases, a whole new group of people? Yeah. What is it about the culture of making a movie? That it's exactly like summer with? camp. You go to yeah. summer camp. If you've been to summer camp, you've been on a movie location. Yeah. You want the best bunk, you want the best looking girl. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's great. I mean, that was always the thing about Bob. If you weren't in his pictures, you were mortified because you knew you were missing a great time. You know, he was such a great host. Yeah. Uh, oh, those locations were just wonderful. How long were his shoots, generally speaking? I mean, some, I mean, Nashville's a pretty long film, but. Um, yeah, 10 weeks, 8 weeks, 10, ten weeks, weeks, 8 but weeks. But he kept moving, he was quick, you know. Yeah. So, you know, he didn't fool around too much. Yeah, no. I mean, well, that was a spectacular film to make. That was so much fun. Nashville. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. He said, I've got all my money in film stock. And he said, so you can take these parts as far as you want to. You remember this? And he said, but if you bore me, I'm going to cut you out. <laughs> and so, and yeah. so people were handing me, you know, 10 pages of type dialogue that I should learn other actors, you know. I said, Bob, you want to shoot this stuff? And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll shoot it. He would use a little snippet of something. Yeah. But actors made up enormous parts of that picture. Geraldine Chaplin wanders through this movie making, uh, the, spouting these arias, and she'd made up every line of it. And Bob hadn't heard it until they shot it. I mean, it was, uh, and there's a scene where, what was the, who was Barbara Jean's name, the actress? Uh, no, she was Ronnie. Yeah, Ronnie Blakely, Ronnie Blakely, who stepped into that role. She was there to write songs, and Susan Onspach quit, and she, she <laughs> stepped in. And she has a scene on a stage where she cracks up. She's singing a song and she breaks up. She wrote every word of that. Oh, my grandma, my grandma, and the chicken, she had chickens, bock, 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 and all this stuff. My Idaho home. Oh, yeah. my God. And, and she went up to his, his room. To, he said, let me read this for you. And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll see it when, I, when you shoot it. And I thought, God. And, and we had a big audience and everything for it, you know. And uh, I mean, she just blew the socks off everybody. And, and we, I think it was all done in a couple of takes, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, she's Fantastic. great. She was a fabulous, oh. I thought, singer-songwriter. Oh, she yeah. did great work. I mean, she's still out there. Yeah, I brought her to Vermont years ago, yeah. and she was, yeah, she was fabulous. So, it, so it's true that on Altman films, actors wrote their own dialogue. Oh, yeah. It depends on the movie, but that one especially we did. What that. about improvisation? There was there plenty of, of that. Uh, so, what, and during the shooting, improvisation? Yeah, there was plenty of that. Yeah, uh, and kind of, and a lot of. Um, uh, Paraphrasing, you know, you sort of break it down. Uh -huh. he, he just wanted very real behavior. That was mm -hmm. what he was interested in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was in scenes with him. I can remember when we were doing Tanner, we, I ran for president one year. <laughs> against, the real, against the real guys, it was fun. We were up around here, and we were all over um, New Hampshire. You know, I'd stand out in front of the factories and everything with those guys, and I never got busted. I'd be out there with George Bush and, you know, Haig or whatever that guy's name was, and I'd... I am Jack Tanner, I'm running for president. Oh yeah, good luck, you know. <laughs> <laughs> these, these guys just wanted to get to work, you know. They were, uh, but um, I can remember a scene in that where I, they'd shot my side of it, like in a two shot, and then they went over and covered somebody, and then they had to come back on me for some reason. And I said, uh, in, the, in the interim, I had unbuttoned my collar and pulled my tie down, and I said, oh God, Bob, we're gonna have to shoot that again, because I, we'd already shot that, that's what we did. I took it down and we shot it. And I said, oh, we've got to redo that because I didn't have my tie on. He said, Nobody, nobody's going to know but you and me. I mean, you've played a lot of politicians. Yeah. Um, you played John F. Kennedy also. Yes, I did, on an island with Marilyn Monroe. Right. We were, we'd come back to life, the two of us. <laughs> it was actually a pretty funny movie, but it, it rubbed people the wrong way. <laughs> I was jealous of Frank Sinatra, that kind of stuff. <laughs> And she yeah, would play Frank Sinatra songs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I could be playing that guy again. <laughs> yeah, that was quite an experience. So, I mean, to a certain extent, you, you played a number of politicians, and you also played a number of adulterers. Yeah. Um, 
I couldn't get a date for four years. I after after an unmarried woman, I was finished with women. That was tough. So, oh, that was hard. Emma, hey, tell I me. You, you, I got a lot out of you. <laughs> The, you, 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 yes, I called you what the first whining yuppie. Yes, I called myself that. That the, was my. And that was your. Yeah. yeah, I referred to myself. Yeah, the original whining yuppie. The original whining yuppie. I don't want to leave, but I have to. <laughs> uh, yeah. Before we leave, the question just of, of working with Altman a little bit. Um, so actors were free to sort of rewrite the because I worked with Henry Gibson twice who worked with Altman and, and Henry yeah. would always come in and want to rewrite his stuff and so I now see where he got it but uh, well he wrote all those songs and everything yeah he, oh my god yeah but um, how so to what extent take by take did Altman interact with you as an actor I mean was it was always brief it was always like go stand over by the window or something you know I mean it was like it was never like he'd never like delve into it with you he you didn't know. delve into character. He always didn't give quick. you playable action. He uh, didn't. Yeah, sometimes playable action. Yeah. He, like he was so sensitive. Uh, I, in that scene that I was telling you about with Alan and me, um, he noticed that Tina. I looked down. I saw her hand kind of trembling, and uh, I thought, "Oh God, she's because she was so blasé. I mean, wasn't she? She was so cool." And I thought, "Shit, this girl is scared," you know. And Bob didn't never said a word. He walked in, walked in in between takes, and he's looking around, and he sees this bottle of cold cream on the table. And he says, "Turn to see." He says, "Put that on your face." So he gave her that action, and she did it, and it just worked like a charm. You know, yeah, just calmed her right down. Well, sometimes that's it. An action can. Yeah. Uh, but he never referred to it as you know. He just said, "Oh, this will be. This is a good idea. Try this." Right. Can put you in a different direction, different mindset. Take your mind off of what's distracting you. He was always. He, Totally positive. I mean, you could do no wrong. You know, he was. Uh, everything was encouraging, encouragement. He only picked on the studio guys. You know, the, the guys that wanted to change his movies and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because he he fought in World War Two at 19. He was he was. They were doing bombing runs over uh, the South Pacific. So when he got back to uh, directing movies, uh, you know, he, he the studio guys didn't mean anything to him, you know, and, and that was an interesting time, and I'm sure you've done work with those same guys of that same vintage, I mean, they were afraid of no one, you know, it wasn't any of this cinema school, my vision stuff, it was like, you know, this, yeah, let's make this movie and have some fun, you know, and, right, and he didn't like authority, you know, he was one right. of those guys, that, sort of an anarchist, all of you veterans out there know there's a you go in the service, there's a big line between officers and, and the enlisted guys. And, and uh, you're not supposed to be fraternizing, really. And uh, Bob didn't care about any of that. He was always out gambling with a you know, PFC and, and breaking those rules and being busted for it. And, uh, and he was a great pilot, and he came out of second lieutenant the same way he went in, you know, because mm -hmm. he got smacked around a couple yeah. of times. <laughs> right. So he applied all of that to the movies, and he was the most democratic of directors uh, uh -huh. I've ever met. Yeah. Huh. Great. Let's uh, hand, hand the mic to Evan <laughs> for a minute. Let's see what he has to say. Now, Roger Ebert said there was the Stanton Walsh rule. You know about that? Yes. <laughs> that. What did it, what did it mean? Well, you started, you turkey. <laughs> no, he said, uh, uh, and, and, uh, he were, the, uh, they picked on me, they picked up on me early on. And, uh, uh, and you know, because the, the work I did wasn't repetitive. I was doing all kinds of different things. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, they said any any movie that had Harry Harry Dean stand and Emmett Walsh and it couldn't be all that. And then later on, I did a movie that I violated my own rule. <laughs> but, uh, but that was not, and I I, I I talked to him one time at, at one point. But he was he was very nice. He he loved film, you know, Ebert. Yeah, yeah. Ebert, yeah. But there, okay. And and so um. Uh, 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 the uh, so so it, so we're talking a little bit today about the idea of the character actor. Okay, both you guys, and and I, is that a term that you embrace? Is it a term that you think you know is demeaning? Is it a term that, I mean, how do you view the idea of the character actor? I mean, 
I have some thoughts about it, but I'm just, what are you thinking, Emmett? What are, what are your thoughts? What are my thoughts? Well, my thought is, one of my thoughts is that the character actor in some ways has more freedom to go and sort of become invisible inside a role to really stake out more ambitious, you know, sort of territory, whereas a star actor is constrained in some ways by, I mean, especially in Hollywood, the, the typecasting of the star. Tom Cruise has got to deliver Tom Cruise. You guys are in some ways freer to go and find stuff that's specific and distinctive and, you know, has more shades of gray. Uh, you, you also can play villains. It's rare that star actors play villains. Uh, so I don't, just to, to, you know, think about that a little bit. Yeah, do, do, what do you think when that, when somebody says character actor to you, what do you say? Uh, the, uh, uh, well, I said, if you, if you watch me on the Saturday night when the bars close, you know what a character actor is. The women all go home and leave me there. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, uh, I started out in the theater. I'm a, you know, I'm a stage actor, and uh, uh, I was brought in. I was brought in to move the situation. I wasn't brought in to let you see Emmett Walsh. You know, I wanted you to see the garbage collector or, uh, you know, a, a cop or the president of Princeton. And when I play the president of Princeton or Harvard or something, I get letters that say, will you get off of our school, please? But you're, you're hurting it greatly. The, uh, the uh, I, I, I just, I always felt my job was to, uh, to, to move it, you know, not to, not to play what made me look good. Of course, I get paid the same way. You know, they, uh, they, uh, so and so gets X, and you take X and divide it by 37, and you get my salary. The, uh, but here, but here, but here. Take, it, no. take it back. Take it, take it. Well, I wanted to be a movie star myself. <laughs> <laughs> I went out there. I can remember I was in New York as well, and uh, was being defeated by the city. And I, I was. I remember specifically. I was watching television one night, and Dr. Kildare was on. And I thought, shoot, I could do that. I could play what they do with that guy. So I went out to L.A. And I started to work. Altman got a hold of me. It goes back to Bob. I had been there 20 minutes and I met him. And uh, he, what he liked about me was I had this really straight look. And he'd have me do diabolical things on the screen. He just thought that was hilarious. You know, it was always the straightest looking guy that would want to murder the, the girl or something. The wasp yeah. yeah, but he was really corrupt or something. Good looking guy. And I did corrupt. picture after yeah. picture like that with him. Yeah. And he once said to me, uh, he said, well, you know, you can, uh, they'd offered me some kind of a television series while we were making the movie. And he said, well, you can do that crap as he puts it. But he said, you can, you can play interesting people, you know. You won't be a movie star, but you'll learn. Uh -huh. And it, it, it's really why you do it. You, 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 I never play myself on the screen. You know, I, I, I'm always it's always somebody else. Uh, that yeah, you conjure up. Whereas if you were Tom, or although Cruz has done some good, I was in a picture with him called uh, Magnolia, and he was damn yeah. good in that movie. Yeah. I was, and so you know, I sometimes I look at him, and I think, geez, you missed your calling. <laughs> you know, because. You can do this stuff if you want to do it. Right. I mean, Magnolia is, is, is really an Altman-like film, also, yeah, yeah. where this, this it's not about the star. Yeah. Uh, exactly. and so he had. I mean, and so what you're saying is he Tom was a big. Cruz, he, uh, what's his name? Uh, the director was a big fan of Bob. So T. Anderson. Yeah. yeah. When Bob was very sick at the end, and he did his last movie, Andrew, he had to have a, another director on the set in order to get um, insurance, and so Anderson. Anderson went and sat by his side during that whole shoot in case he kicked in the middle of it. He was gonna, he yeah. was gonna be there to, you know. Yeah. And it was very interesting. I've seen stills of the two of them just looking at the uh, screen. You know, the, they sit in Video Village there, and they're both just really intent. Yeah. Uh, was that Prayer Home Companion? Yeah. 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 Right. So yeah, they were uh, they were great friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 part of the reason I think Henry and I were in that movie was it was sort of a little. Tribute homage to, Bob. to Albert. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great film. And uh... well, that was an interesting thing. You know, the gal in that, uh, uh, the redhead, wonderful actress, um, Julianne Moore. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Who prompted me? Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, Apple something. Apple that girl. Anyway, Julianne and I were in the first scene together of the movie, and. Um, 
she had just played in Boogie Nights, and she was a little concerned because she played a um, junkie and a coke addict in Boogie Nights, and she said, I have to be stoned in this, but I, I don't want to do the, I can't do the same thing. It's got to be a different drug, you know. <laughs> so, so we get, his, all this was was a shot of me, and it was just across a, a desk. And they decided to do my stuff first because we had a rain effect, and I wanted to get finished with that. And so she's off camera, and I'm shooting my lines, and all I had was I had to say things like, Linda, oh, Linda, Linda, come on, Linda. And she was you know, carrying on and this stuff, and I've slept with other men, and I've done it. She wanted to change her will or something. She suddenly decided she loved her husband, and she was loaded. And so she's doing this magnificent performance, and I'm all, 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 the only one on camera, and I, I, I got caught up in it, <laughs> and I kept blowing my lines. I was, you know, I was, it was just, a, and they said, it's your, it's your turn. <laughs> it was, I never had an experience like that, and then it, it, you just feel this heat coming across the desk, you know, and then they um, turned around on her, and I thought, well, she, you know, I've seen it all now, I've seen everything she's got, and, you know, so I'll be able to say my words, and boy, she ratcheted that up another notch, and I tell you, it was, it was just one of the most exciting experiences I ever, ever had on that. Mm -hmm. in the movies was working with oh my god yeah. yeah she was just and she went on and on and on i mean it was a big long you know mm -hmm. deal yeah it's got every nuance you know yeah gotta hand it to that gal yeah and sweet She's as fabulous. they come yeah. just a lovely woman they got cut and she you know yeah right so how about you emmett uh, experiences you've had you know working with another actor working with the director that you know stays with you so what, what what a good moment in uh in movies the uh working other actors how about me you work uh, with me uh, yeah you keep bringing that up and i've forgotten uh, <laughs> the, the uh whenever i worked with actresses i always deferred i always let this you know if, if there was tension or if there was uh, problems or anything i let the i let the women have it and i didn't get in the way and uh, smart and yeah it was smart and uh, my mother must have raised me that way the uh, and uh, uh, what the hell was the question <laughs> a moment we're working with a particular actor, actor a particular like. director well, that uh, really sticks with yeah, you I, uh, and was something uh, that you remember the uh, uh, yeah damn it I, I uh, obviously you know I'm here to display to you people the early effects of Alzheimer's <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I'm doing a good job <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the question right. how about working with Warren Beatty what was that like uh, what, what did I do with Warren Reds uh, oh, oh Reds I, I opened the movie uh, on Reds and uh, I I uh, I uh, I did this presentation and I said, uh, John Reed, the character theme, John Reed, did he? Play? Yeah. And I, and, and uh, I said, what, what do you think this is about John Reed? And I give the, you know, the, over to Warren. And I, uh, I spoke, I spoke for like, uh, like uh, three minutes before I introduced him it, when yeah. we were shooting it. And I shot and shot and shot because he's also directing it. You know, uh, Warren is also directing the film. Right. Yeah. You know? And I talked and talked, and, and then he got up, and he talked for 20 minutes, take after take, day yeah, after day, day. <laughs> you know, and it went on forever. And it, we're, this was the first week of the film, and it's it's endless, endless, endless. And I'm in the war, I'm in the makeup room afterwards or later, <clears throat> and the English makeup people, the hairdressers, the makeup artists, they bid a job. They said, "We'll do it for this. We'll do it for this," you know. And uh, I heard the the makeup man talked in the wardrobe lady he said I have made a big mistake <laughs> <laughs> and then negotiation uh, but it, it took for, you know it took forever I mean it's uh, you listen apropos of that on McCabe he, he's a controlling guy Warren you know he wants it the way he wants it and so this is a famous story about him he was uh, he was shoot, we were shooting this stuff at one night and Bob had it in like, you know, a half an hour, and he was 
the exact opposite of Warren, who wants to do a hundred takes and get you know. And so uh, he said, "We're going to do it again. We want to. I would want to do one more." And Bob said, "Look, I got what I want." He said, uh, "You want to shoot some more? Go ahead and turn out the lights when you leave." And he left. <laughs> <laughs> and Warren went on shooting. <laughs> He, he, he worked for another hour and a half on that scene yeah. by himself. <laughs> That's true. I have a Warren Beatty story too, but I won't tell it today. Why not? Um, the, well, I, I, very quickly, I, I, I had an encounter with Warren Beatty at the, Republic, at the Democratic Convention in 1976. I saw uh, an old girlfriend of mine from college who we hadn't seen each other, and she said, let's have dinner, let's do something. I said, fine, let's do it. And she had met Warren Beatty in passing a year earlier in a parking lot in Los Angeles where he said, come with me. And she said, no. And he said, here's my card, call me. Okay? So I'm standing there talking to her, her name is Stephanie, and Warren Beatty came up the stairs with a young woman on each arm. And he stopped and he said, Stephanie. He remembered her name. And she said, Warren. Uh, and he said, uh, remember me? And she said, of course. And he said, come with me. <laughs> now he's got a woman, a young gal on each arm. And so uh, she says, well, I'm with my friend Jay and we have a place. He said, ditch him. <laughs> I'm standing right oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, I don't think so. We're gonna, we're gonna, and he said, he gives her his card and says, call me. Goes up the stairs. Uh, and these two young gals, like 16, were sort of coming up the stairs to get a glimpse of him saying, Warren Beatty, Warren Beatty. And he turns and he says, I have that effect on women. <laughs> that was my Warren Beatty story. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. Talk to Emmett about the fact that he played most iconic role in a cult film called Slapshot. Slapshot, which Alan Nichols was also part of. Um, Dickie Dunn. Dickie Dunn wrote it. It's got to be true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Slapshot. Who directed the Slapshot? Huh? George Roy Hill. George Roy Hill. George Roy. Paul Newman they, was in they, it. They had, me, they had me in a bar at one point. When I was sitting and George said he got to shoot walls before one because it's oh all yeah. <laughs> I've been. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I've been in a few of those movies. Yeah. Get them before the sun goes down. Yeah. yeah. Right. Tell them about uh, um, Straight Time. You were just great in that. Tell the Dustin they, Hoffman. When he hung you on the fence. Straight Time. The uh, oh yeah oh yeah. <clears throat> and uh, there was a, a rating of films back back then. You. Uh, any uh, any uh, frontal nudity in a movie was an automatic X rating, uh, and uh, so you you tried to avoid that whole thing. I did a movie called Straight Time where Dustin Hoffman is a uh, I pick him up from prison. I'm taking him someplace in my car, and he overpowers me on the freeway. He's his parole and, officer. Yeah, I'm his parole officer, and he overpowers me on the freeway, and he ended up hooking me to a fence with my handcuffs. And the cars are going by on both sides, the passing the freeway. And, uh, and then he starts to leave and comes back and he pulls down my trousers. And, uh, and there's my, my bare ass hanging out in the wind. And at one point, I kind of made a turn on a shot. And then, you know, and, and, it's, it, and I, I, heard the, I heard the review board looked at it and, the, and they said, Nah, nah, that's, that's not where the next gift we are. <laughs> so so, so I, I, I do interviews with my legs crossed. <laughs> uh, okay. It was great in that movie. How about working with Oliver Stone? Oh, God. Oh, that was very interesting. He, this was really, he'd done a couple of really minor, this was, this was in a picture called Salvador, which was going to be his first big, you know, step out there, yeah. and he, um, we got down to Mexico, the, one of the things that I reminded me of, uh, that I always think about with him, and we're shooting in this jungle, and uh, he, the day before, they, they had a million dollars to shoot the movie, and they put it into pesos, and the bottom dropped out of the peso like the next day, and now they had half a million dollars to make the movie, and, you know, every, everybody was nervous about it, and, uh, 
and I saw him kind of looking out in the jungle with this sort of faraway look, and I said to him, I don't know why, I, and I, because I didn't know him much, again, I didn't know much about him. I was in from New York, and I, and uh, I said, were you in Vietnam, you know, because he had that weird look. <laughs> he said, oh yeah, and he kind of blew it off. And um, I can remember later, uh, we um, were having lunch, I think that same day, and the guy, I don't know if any of you know that movie, but it's like these two reprobates are going down to Latin America, and they get in trouble, and you know, they've got girlfriends down there, and they get on a, they're gonna get on a kill list, and this was actually Oliver and the guy who wrote the thing, this, this is their, was their story, you know, hijinks in Latin America during bad times, and uh, in Salvador. So, anyway, to make a long story short, um, I said, what are you going to do? What are your plans? You know, we were getting towards the end of the movie, and he said, well, he said, I got this army thing that's sitting in my pocket. I've had it in there for years. He said, but I, he said they want to make it, but I don't know. I sort of moved past it, and he was very, you know, he said, I, I got to work. And, uh, and so that was Platoon. Yeah, so he, so he reluctantly made Platoon. It became this huge hit and made his life for him, you know. Interesting guy. Intense. Yeah. Yeah. If it, let's take a couple, couple questions from the audience. Yeah. Sydney Lumet. Sydney Lumet, Sydney Lumet uh, which who Emin worked Evan worked with twice. Yeah, or more than that. Serpico and. Uh, did I do it twice? He did. did he did Serpico did, twice. I did Serpico, but I do another one. I think Lumet? he did another Sydney Lumet. Um, did I both well, times? Yeah. Yeah. Sydney, anyway, Sydney forgettable. Very, forgettable. Sydney was very fat. Sydney uh, was. You rehearsed the day before, you know. Then uh, they, they refer to it as laying steel. How, how much track can you lay? Yeah. They take it, you know. Then you'd move, and move, and move. He didn't waste any time at all. So uh, if an actor knows he's not going to get three or four takes, he will be ready for it. And you were ready for it, Sydney. Does that answer your question? Good. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. Um, how's the movie business changed, Emmett? I mean, you've been doing films, you know, long time. I mean... Black and white, no <laughs> sound. Yes, I am. Right. I started in have. black and white. You both have. I mean, you guys did early TV also. You were both yeah. on Bonanza. Yeah. Right? You were on The Man From U.N.C.L.E. I was on Bonanza. Yeah, we yeah. Both. you both were on Bonanza. I got a great Bonanza story. Do you have any Bonanza or any of those? No, I'll, I'll look in yours. If I want to top it, I will. All right, this, this, you, can, you can relate to this one. So, so I come into town and I'm uh, the I'm the new Bronco Buster for these guys. And this was their uh, ode to civil rights. This is right in the, during the '70s and all that was you know every Paris was or, or the Bronx was burning and all that. So they wanted to do a civil rights story. And I come into town and I, I said, "Hi, I'm your new Bronco Buster." I get out of the stagecoach, you know. I was sort of and so. There's some tough guys hanging around, and uh, they say hello to me. And my wife steps out, and she's all in buckskin. She's Indian. She's an Indian. So the guy, the wise guys, start calling me Squaw Man and all that. So I deck this big stunt, <laughs> and I stand over him and deliver this lecture about, you know, my my wife's father is an Ugalala chief, you know, and all this. And I kept. Kind of leaning out of the, as I was standing over him delivering the lecture, I kept leaning and I was leaning out of frame and they kept having to reshoot it. <laughs> and so I said at one point, I said, I don't know why I do that. And Haas said, I know why you do it. You've seen all those Steve McQueen movies. And, and, and they were standing behind me, these three guys, and they were, this was well into the series. The father was there, Haas was there, and I think it was Michael Landon. Yeah. And I'm, playing this scene and I can hear ice cubes in glasses and I think what the hell's going on and I was in front of them so I was blocking the, them and they were so relaxed about this thing it was about four o'clock they all had drinks they were having drinks <laughs> and so they'd say you know they would we start okay we're rolling and they take they okay and they just hold, hold it behind my back while I was spouting this dialogue <laughs> cut oh that was slow <laughs> Oh, they were characters. Yeah, talk about being, you know, sure of yourself. <laughs> How do you compare uh, working on a film to TV, generally? Well, it's all uh, TV's a lot faster. I mean, you know, it's boom, boom, boom. I, I think both of us 
came up in a time when TV was a lot better. Well, no, TV's kind of come back, but but uh, we were, um, when I came out there, I told you that Dr. Kildare thing. So I come out to Hollywood and I get a job right away on um, ben, Casey. ben Casey. And that was the, yeah, that was, Kildare was the clean guy and Casey was the kind of, you know, he was, what was that guy's name? Ben, Vince uh, Edwards. He was kind of, yeah. Had his gown unbuttoned and everything, his hairy chest and <laughs> So, so they put me in uh, because I looked a little bit like Richard. I always had that clean Richard Chamberlain look, and I would play the the guy. And I did a lot of these. Or I'd be standing over some actor laid out, you know, in the bed, and, and Vince would walk in the room, and I'd say, I don't know, Doctor, you he won't, he won't let me examine him. And I'll take care of that. You take the board, you know, and that sort of. <laughs> leave <laughs> so we were essentially putting Richard Chamberlain down you know in those pictures and, and the day I got that part the day it all started um, I uh, I had to go down I met the producers and they said well go down and meet Vince because he he you gotta get past him if you want the part and he, they said and he doesn't like guys that are taller than he is we were about the same height but he said so be aware of that you know bend your knees or do something <laughs> so I go down and I'm reaching for the door of the stage, and the door opens, and there is Sam Jaffe, you know, Gunga Din, the sweetest guy you ever met. And he said, oh, are you looking for somebody? Can I help you? And I said, yeah. I said, I have to go get past Vince so I can get in, the, in this TV show. And he took me by the arm, and he walked me a long way, clear across this stage. It was, it was very dark. Vince liked the stage dark. And we tripped over to the cables and we worked our way over to him. And he said, now Vincent, give this boy this part. He's a nice boy. And uh, Vincent, ah, okay, you know. So it was really Sam that got me on the show. He was just, you know, you talk about generosity. A lovely guy. I used to see him and Edward G. Robinson walking around Beverly Hills all the time together. These two old guys, you know. Very simpatico. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I knew him a little bit. My father was on the edges of the business in the, when I was a little kid and I can remember being at his house and he said um, come here kid I'll show you something and, and he flipped the switch and there was it started to rain on his roof he had sprinklers on his roof and he said I'd have them put up there because I can't sleep without the rain and, he, <laughs> and I thought well you know these guys came out they were all from New York of poverty and they just built their dream houses and he had this great art collection and, you know he was living high living large terrific guy it's that old school you know stuff so um, Emmett, Emmett you did a couple pictures with Robert Redford yeah. do you remember those yeah yeah ordinary people right Milagro Beanfield War well I knew I knew Bob from way back <clears throat> when, you, when you started in New York you, you, they, they told you uh, hang out where the actors hang out. You know, go where the actors go. So I was a drinker, and all the actors, your, your curtain was down at 11 o'clock, you go to a bar. And the actors are there, the, the theater bars in New York, right, all in the, the same district. And you get used to them. And uh, uh, I knew I knew Redford from uh, from the theater bars and so forth. And I ended up, they, they had the Broadway softball league and the Broadway bowling league. During the summer on Thursdays, you play in Central Park. All the, all the different shows have their uh, their softball teams in the, in the league, real competitive. And then during the winter, they bowl at uh, midnight on a Thursday night. They bowl until three, four o'clock in the morning. So I was up in Central Park, hanging around, trying to hook on with us with a uh, with a softball team. I was an old an old jock, and uh, they came over. Somebody comes over and he says, uh, "You looking to hook on to a team?" And I said, "Yeah." So I ended up pitching for Barefoot in the Park. I had no credit, I knew nobody. Redford was my first baseman. Neil Simon was my second baseman. You know, and you know, come on Neil, pick that grounders up, come on, you know. I had no credits at all. Redford's, Redford's here, and I knew Bob from way back then, you yeah. know. And then, <clears throat> then we did a couple of movies. What were the films? Milagro, Beanfield War, and uh, Ordinary People. Ordinary, yeah, he hired me for Ordinary People. And, uh, and, uh, you know, everybody got an award except me for, you know, on Ordinary People. Oh. They, they kept kicking them out and they stopped. But, <laughs> but uh, and then Milagro was uh, the Indian thing up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but Bob, Bob was, uh, 
you come out of if if you're if you're in the uh, the film business, you come out of one of you come out of a you're a, you're a writer, you're a director, or you're an actor. You're your background, and you have to learn the other disciplines. You know, you know how to handle the actors, but you have to learn how to handle the camera. And uh, Bob knew how to handle the actors, and he had to learn the the camera side, the technical side. And uh, uh, I worked with. Uh, what, what they would do is, what, if you were a good actor, you, they, you, they'd say, uh, uh, I need you to go to the window. And you'd say, well, why? And he'd say, well, I'm going to cut it this way, this way. You know, it's okay. Then you'd say, well, maybe I heard a car backfire. You know, or something. You work it in as an actor. You co you'll come up with the, the, the reason for it. And uh, you get used to those kind of people. The worst kind were the people that, I did a, I did a movie, uh, Called Cannery Row. Yeah. The guy didn't know. The guy didn't know the camera. He didn't know. He had written the script and he was paranoid. And everything yeah. we did paralyzed him. And uh, it was it was terrible. It was terrible. So uh, I hope I damned him. Wherever you are. <laughs> the uh, what was the question? I have no idea. Where did you start me from? Redford. Yeah. Good. Bye. Bye, Bob. What was the first, two, uh, two what, what was the first yeah. uh, one that you asked him about with the Redford thing? Uh, what? A logro bean field. No, the other one. The other picture. Yeah, I had a long romance with him over ordinary people. Um, Who, Redford? Or yeah, me? Redford. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and, and, my, uh, my legs are still crossed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. And I, uh, yeah, I had a long kind of, he was having trouble casting the woman, I remember, but he was talking to me hot and heavy about that part, and he gives it to Donald Sutherland, give me a break. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Bob. Questions from the audience. We have room for maybe two. Yes, right here. I was watching uh, Black Mass both yesterday, watching Johnny Depp, who just was creepy as Whitey Bulger, and then he's been in his, his Alice in Wonderland films and Pirates of the Caribbean. And it got me thinking about how you approach, as a character actor, different characters. Is there sort of one process that you go through to, for better, want of a better word, find a character? Or do you look at each character completely The question is, uh, watching uh, Black Mass and seeing Johnny Depp so different from what we normally see him do, also playing a bad guy, uh, in approaching character, when you get the part, what do you do? I don't have a real method. I mean, I, I just, you know, you read the thing and you go, oh yeah, I, know, I can do this if I do that, or, or something will come to mind uh, during, during Nashville. I was reminded of a guy I knew in high school who was, a, who I mean, college, who became a dirty trickster for Richard Nixon, you know. And I thought, oh yeah, that wise guy, I re kind of remembered him. And the idea was that he, had, had Nixon not won, he would have been back to selling hospital furniture or something. And, and with Nixon winning, he, he was going to be a big shot in the administration. So this guy, I thought he was sort of, this was his big break. And he, he gave him an earnestness, you know. So you, I... I think you look at them all a little bit differently. I did a couple of pictures where I did my Jack Nicholson impression, you know, it wasn't very good. <laughs> but you know, you pick up little, you get ideas and you, you think about them a lot, really, basically. I don't go into any specific method. You know, or you find an angle or a look. A look is always good. Find the right pair of pants or something. You know. Emmett, you get a part, it's a bad guy. Something, I mean, we're thinking Johnny Depp here, who has to play a really heinous character. What, what do you do? I mean, how do you, how do you find a way to believe in the character? Uh, I, I have no idea. I was thinking, <clears throat> I was thinking one time I was look, I was looking for some for the character, for a character, somebody for a long time, and uh, and I remember uh, I said, ah, and I I uh, I picked my nose. You know? Yeah, that works. And then I ate it. <laughs> yeah, that really worked. <laughs> and I said, and it worked for the character. <laughs> but, so that was your way in. Yeah, but, but I, I had to, I had to bring it from my youth. <laughs> he had a great move last night. He was dying, and he picked up his hat and put it on his head. Yeah. 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 I seem to think I came up with that myself, but I, yeah. I don't know. The Coen brothers knew everything. Those things, the, uh, those things occurred to you. But that, there was a sense of character. That hat was the character. Yeah. 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 Uh, I know what happened. One more question? Or you're somebody's nephew, you know. Or you're somebody's nephew. 
Or you're somebody's nephew. Yeah, you can take something small and, and then build on it. Uh -huh. I mean, somebody said the Coen brothers in making Miller's Crossing, the whole movie started with the idea of the hat being thrown. You know, and that sort of was the first image that they began to work with and build on. So it's, it's if you think about it too much, you you destroy it. That's part of the deal. Is well, you're, you're that's that classic thing, you know, what, the, the, the cinema lot of guys all say, what was the significance of that hat on that bed? I don't know, somebody put it there. <laughs> you know, but it yeah. takes on this great meaning. Actually, a hat on a bed has, like, it's like an old superstition. It's the bad, really, really Oh, is it? Hat on a bed is a bad luck. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's my Fred. hat on many a bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't have a career. <laughs> yeah, right. Could either of you describe your favorite part? It's a fair question. Do you have a favorite part? A favorite part? Yeah, whether in experience or either the role itself or the experience of playing the role. Fav a favorite part or? Yeah, I mean, I'm finding that I'm getting, he said modestly, I'm getting better as I get older. Do you find that? I think, well, maybe I'm just getting more confident, but I used to, I was always going, is that okay, Bob? Is that okay, Woody? Did that work okay? You know? And now I don't give a shit. <laughs> 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 and I sort of take it on, you know? And, yeah. Uh, so I got in, I, I hightailed it to Canada, but I got married a Canadian woman and moved up there and I started making Canadian movies about 20 years ago. And it, it worked well because down here they started blowing up cars and stuff and I wasn't much interested in that. So I started making all these low budget Canadian movies that were pretty good. And the last one I made was a, a thing about a priest. And it was, and, and Canadian film, yeah. Yeah, and I, um, I had worked on it with this director that I was sort of part of the package. And I got it to where he didn't talk very much. I mean, I said, look, I can do that with a look, you know, with a take. And it's kind of, it's sort of Ingmar Bergman without the maestro, you know, it's sort of a low-grade Ingmar Bergman movie that we shot in a cold, dark country. With it. And, um, but it kind of worked because, you know, you, you see it going on in the guy's head. And I thought, to me, that was real cinema. It was a real chance to, so nobody, you'll, you'll never get to see this movie, but um, it was, I was great. <laughs> <laughs> I hardly said a word. A favorite part, Emma? A favorite part, a part that you remember? No, uh, yeah. No, I, I, I don't, you know, they're all my children. They're all your children, 100, <laughs> the, uh, 117 <laughs> children. The, uh, no, I, uh, I, when I, yeah, I'm always surprised when I stumble on one of my, like last night, yeah. stumble on a film and I say, man, he, he, he was all right. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't as bad as I thought yeah. he was. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always pleased. The, yeah. uh, no, I don't know. I, uh, I don't go looking for my stuff when I see him. I, uh, I watch him. I say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. What about I, uh, the theater role? Huh? The role in the theater. What role? What? Yeah, like a favorite role from the plays you did. When did you start losing your hair? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, After I met you. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, no, I, I, I don't. You know, I, as I say, look, I'm, I'm 82 years old. I, I don't know where I parked my car when I came here yesterday. <laughs> Come on, I don't remember anything. <laughs> Boy. Although you said that you were in an interview, you said that your dream role would have had be to play opposite Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, uh, well, yeah, well, I said. No, no, I said, if if I was hired and J for a movie and Jamie Lee Curtis was madly in love with me, you know, you knew I was dead in seven minutes and she would spend the rest of the film looking for the killer. Yeah. <laughs> that, was just, that, that was as far as my romances went. <laughs> you know, this thing about forgiving yourself is true. I mean, I, what are you just talking about? I. I, I even ran across that Bronco Buster part once, and I thought, oh God, I had seen it, you know, when it first came out. I thought, oh my God, I'll never work again, you know. And, uh, and I went and looked at it. It was just on TV in the daytime or something. And I went, oh, it wasn't so bad. I was, I was a little, I was affecting a southern accent or something. And that's what he said, it's some weird walk. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it didn't call attention to itself. I thought, oh, that's pretty good. It was, I got by. You, know. you get easier on yourself. Or like you just don't give a shit. <laughs> All right, I think that um, 
We have another show to go to, so thank you very much, these guys. A uh, few good laughs in the morning. And uh, uh, Michael will appear again after Nashville with Alan Nichols. Um, also, Bob Nemi's going to be here, uh, who's an Altman scholar, and we'll take it from there. I see Barbara Koppel here. She's got her movie this afternoon. Uh, Gigi Gorgeous. Yes. I totally, I, I totally agree with you.